Oh my Lord, Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. Oh my Lord, Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. Oh, all pervading personality of God. Oh, all pervading personality of God here. How from my respectful obeisances unto you. How from my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primal cause of all causes. And the primal cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. He's directly and directly conscious of all manifestations. And he's independent because there's no other cause beyond and him. And he is independent because there's no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji? It is the only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representation. As one is bewildered by the illusory representation. Of water seen in fire or land seen in water. Of water seen in fire or land seen in water. Only because of him do the material universes. Only because of him do the material universes. Temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature. Temporarily mm. manifested by the reaction of the three modes of nature. Appear factual, although they are unreal. Appear factual, although they are unreal. And therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. Therefore, I meditate upon him, Lord Shri Krishna. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Which is forever free from the illusory representations in the material world. Which is forever free from the illusory representation of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute Dharma truth. Projita Kaitra Vodra. Dharma Projita Kaitra Vodra. Paramo Nirmatsanam Satam. Paramo Nirmasaranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam Tapa Trayom Shivadam Tapo Trayom Shrimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Shrimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimva Parir Ishwaraha Kimva Parir Ishwaraha Sadyo Hridi Avarudya Tetra Sadyo Hridi Avarudya Tetra Kriti Bihi Susu Subhistakshana Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. This Bhagavat Purana propounds the highest truth. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. The highest truth, the reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of Such all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. Such a truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. And this beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. Is sufficient in itself for God realization. Is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? What is the need of the other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpataror galitam phalam. Nigama kalpataror galitam phalam. Sukhamakad amrita dravya samyutam. Sukhamakad amrita dravya samyutam. Pibata Bhagavatam rasam alayam. Pibata Bhagavatam rasam alayam. Mohor aho rasika bhuvibhavuka. Mohor aho rasika bhuvibhavuka. O oh, expert and thoughtful man, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. O oh, expert and thoughtful man, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectar and juice is already relishable for all. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls, including liberated souls. 
Svakata Krishna Shambhantam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Punya Shravana Kirtana Hiryantak Stohi Bhadrani Hiryantak Stohi Bhadrani Vidhu Nati Suhit Satam Vidhu Nati Suhit Satam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literature To hear about Krishna from the Vedic literature Or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita Or to hear from him directly through Bhagavad Gita Is it self-righteous activity? Itself, righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, and for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who is dwelling within everyone's heart, Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend, acts as a best wishing friend, and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of Him, and purifies the devotee who is constantly engaged in hearing of Him. Nasta preeshu bhadreeshu, nasta preeshu bhadreeshu, nityam bhagavata sevaya, nityam bhagavata sevaya, bhagavati uttama sloke, bhagavati uttama sloke, bhakti bhavati naistiki, bhakti bhavati naistiki. In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. In this way, the devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam. And from the devotees. And from the devotees. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. He becomes fixed in devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhava. Tadarajas tamo bhava. Kama loba dayas che. Kama loba dayas che. Chete taran avidam. Chete taran avidam. Sitam sattve prasidati. Sitam sattve prasidati. By development of devotional service. By development of devotional service. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus material loss and avarice are diminished. And thus material loss and avarice are Evam prasanna manaso. Evam prasanna manaso. Bhagavat bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavat bhakti yoga taha. Bhagavat tattva vigyana. Bhagavat tattva vigyana. Mukta sangha sya jayate. Mukta sangha sya jayate. When these impurities are wiped away. When these impurities are wiped away. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. Becomes enlivened by, becomes enlivened by devotional service. Becomes enlivened by devotional service. And understands the science of God perfectly. And understands the science of God. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Chidyante sarvasam saya. Chidyante sarvasam saya. Siyante chashikarmani. Chidyante sarvasam saya. Drusta evat manishwari. Drusta evat manishwari. Thus, Bhakti Yoga serves the hard knot of material affection. Thus, the Bhakti Yoga serves the hard knot of material affection. And enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. And enables one to come at once to the stage of samsayam samagram. Understanding of the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Understanding the absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna or from his devotee in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna, from devotee, from Krishna, can one under the science can one understand the science of Krishna. Can one understand the science of Krishna? Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto One, Chapter Eighteen, Verse Number Eleven. Risha Uchu, Risha Uchu, Suta. Jiva samak somya, suta jiva samak somya, sasvati visadam yasha, sasvati visadam yasha, yastvam samsa si Krishna sya, yastvam samsa si Krishna sya, martyanam amritam hina, martyanam amritam hina. Translation by Shila Prabhupada. The good sages said. O grave Sutta Goswami, may you live many years and have eternal fame, for you are speaking very nicely about the activities of Lord Krishna, the personality of Godhead. This is just like nectar for mortal beings like us. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. When we hear about the transcendental qualities and activities of the personality of Godhead, we may always remember that it has been spoken by the Lord himself in the Bhagavad Gita 4.9. His acts, even when he acts in human society, are all transcendental, for they are all accentuated by the spiritual energy of the Lord, which is distinguished from his material energy. 
as stated in Bhagavad Gita, such acts are called divyam. Divyam means transcendental. This means that he does not act or take his birth like an ordinary living being under the custody of material energy. Nor is his body material or changeable like that of ordinary, of ordinary living beings. And one who understands this fact, either from the Lord or from authorized sources, is not reborn after leaving the present material body. Such an enlightened soul is admitted into the spiritual realm of the Lord and engages in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. Therefore, the more we hear about the transcendental activities of the Lord, as they are stated in the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, the more we can know about his transcendental nature and thus make definite progress on the path back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada, Patita Pavani Ki Jai. So, the Srimad Bhagavatam is not just a, it's not an ordinary book. It's, it's full of transcendental pastimes of the Lord. And this is an extremely special thing because simply by hearing this, one can be liberated from the cycle of birth and death. Janma karma chame divyam evam yo veti tattvata jakvadeham punarajanma jakvadeham punarajanma naitimam eti sarjana. So, this fourth chapter, verse 9, says that uh, one who engages in hearing about transcendental pastimes of the Lord and understands the, their transcendental nature about his appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take birth again, but comes back or attains the eternal abode so this shows how powerful it is listening to this on a daily basis. And Prabhupada explains in the purport that the Lord's descent from his transcendental abode is already explained in the sixth verse. One who can understand the truth of the appearance of the personality of God is already liberated from material bondage. And therefore, the devotee returns to the kingdom of God immediately after quitting this present material body. Such liberation of the living entity from material bondage is not at all easy. The impersonalists and the yogis attain liberation only after much trouble and many, many births. Even then, liberation they achieve, merging into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti Lord, is only partial, and there is the risk of returning to the material world. But the devotee, simply by understanding the transcendental nature of the body and activities of the Lord, attains the abode of the Lord after ending his, this body and does not run the risk of returning to the material world. In the Brahma Samhita 5.33 it is stated that the Lord has many, many forms and incarnations. Advaitam, Achutam, Anadim, Anantarupam, Adyam Purana Purusham, Naviyobhanamcha. Vedesa Durlabham, Adurlabham, Atma Bhakto, Govinda Madhi Purusham, Tamaham Bhajami. Although there are many transcendental forms of the Lord, they are still one and the same Supreme Personality of Godhead. One has to understand this fact with conviction. Although it is incomprehensible to mundane scholars and empiric philosophers. Well, there you are. That's, that's the whole point. <coughs> that mundane scholars who rely on logic, <coughs> reason, reasoning, and speculation, and uh, speculative uh, philosophies and science, they can't understand what we just read because they can't do these things. They think nobody can do these things, but that's not true. They can't imagine that there's an individual who has unending, uh, 
unfathomable infinite energies and multi multiple energies, not just one, but an infinite number of energies. They're bewildered when they hear such things and they say, oh, this, this is all fairy tales. It was all made up. You can't make this up. Uh, no one has ever written anything like the Srimad Bhagavatam. None of it is made up. It's all factual and it's all nectarian. As it says in the Bhagavatam, Vayam tu na vichipyama utama sloka vikrave yat shindvatam rasa gyanam swadu swadu pade pade. We never tire of hearing the transcendental pastimes of the personality of Godhead who is glorified by hymns and prayers. Those who have developed a taste for transcendental relationships with him relish hearing of his pastimes at every moment. So, <laughs> this is the position of the devotees. It's the devotees not tired of hearing about Krishna's transcendental pastimes. It's also said in the Bhagavad Gita, 10th chapter, 18th verse, which says, Mm. 10th chapter, 18th verse, which says, Viste, Viste reinat mano yogam, vibutim cha janardana, buya kataya triptir hi shinvuto nastime mritam, o janardana. Again, please describe in detail the mystic power of your opulences. I am never satiated in hearing about you. In other words, I'm never satisfied in hearing about you. For the more I hear, the more I want the t to taste the nectar of your words. So this is what you would call the symptom uh, of liberation for a devotee. Because they never tire hearing about Krishna. That's why they do it every day. And for them, this is real happiness. Of course, other people, they never tire hearing about sports. They never tire hearing about the stock market. They never tire hearing about uh, politics. They never tire hearing about uh, disgusting things. Uh, illicit activities. They never tire of hearing about nonsense, just talking nonsense. But devotees are different. They never tire of hearing about Krishna and they ignore all these other things because they're not related to Krishna. So this is uh, extremely important to understand what is the symptom of being a liberated person. And we've been discussing this uh, from the fifth chapter. And uh, Prabhupada says that the living entity is bewildered in his desires. Now, that is what's happening to everyone in the material world. They're bewildered by misguided desires. And the Lord will allow the living entity to pursue or fulfill those misguided desires. But the Lord is never responsible for the actions and reactions uh, that Incur that are incurred by the by the individual. So everything is going to de depend on our desires. And Prabhupada says uh, these material desires are the subtle form of conditioning for the living entity. The more material desires we have, the more we get conditioned by birth, death, old age, and disease and illusion. And Prabhupada says being in a bewildered condition, therefore, the embodied soul identifies himself with the circumstantial material body and becomes subjected to the temporary misery and happiness of life. Well, 
this brings up an important point. That is, that it is impossible to be happy in the material world. Not, not that, oh yeah, you can be happy. No. It's actually impossible to be happy in the material world. Let's see where that's said. Uh, yeah, because when we try to be happy in the material world, we're violating uh, our constitutional position. Okay, so this is explained in the uh, Canto 1, Chapter 9, verse 22. Uh, which says, um, it says, the Supreme, Abs the Supreme Lord, the Absolute Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, although equal to everyone, is still more inclined to his unflinching devotee who's completely surrendered and knows no one else as his protector and master. Having unflinching faith in the Supreme Lord as one's protector, friend, and master is the natural condition of eternal life. A living entity is so made by the will of the Almighty that he is most happy when placing himself in a condition of absolute dependence on the Lord. The opposite tendency is the cause of fall down. The living entity has this tendency of falling down by dint of misidentifying himself as fully independent in order to lord it over the material world. The root cause of all troubles is there in false ego. One must draw, one must draw towards the Lord in all circumstances. In other words, if one has an inflated false ego, then they're just going to have trouble. And the trouble is unending. Then uh, Prabhupada continues. He says, So he describes the world as anityam asukam lokam. Uh, or dukalyam asasvatam. It's a temporary, pl the material world is described as a temporary place and full of misery. And uh, asukam, there's no real happiness in it. So this point is almost, as we said before, almost impossible to understand uh, by materialists. Why is that? Because, as we've said before, due to misleading education and denying the existence of the spiritual world, denying the existence of God, denying uh, uh, any dependence on God or God as a supreme controller, etc. So if there's no knowledge of God, then one is cursed to suffer in the material world by their own uh, let's say, determination not to be, not to take any instruction about uh, one's relationship with Krishna. So, if you read Bhagavad Gita, you'll see, especially in the 13th chapter, that knowledge means understanding uh, material nature, time, the individual soul, the super soul, and ultimately Krishna as the origin of all those things. That's real knowledge. But if you deny the existence of God, then what knowledge do you have? Y you won't understand what is the material nature. You won't understand what is time. Because all those things are dependent on Krishna. They're existing only because of Krishna. And you won't understand yourself. And you won't understand what is the purpose of the body, what is the purpose of the intelligence? None of these things. So this desire is a subtle form of conditioning for a living entity. And the Lord fulfills desire as one 
deserves. In other words, based on your previous karma. Therefore, man proposes, God disposes. Okay. So, the individual is not, therefore, omnipotent in fulfilling his desires. On the other hand, the Lord can fulfill all desires, material or spiritual. But the Lord is neutral. Because he's neutral, if a person insists by meditating all the time on material desires, then he throws his hands up and says, okay, what can I do? You know, the person's completely bewildered. Therefore, let Durga convince them that they're wrong. And Durga is very, very convincing. <laughs> yes. So, uh, therefore, Krishna doesn't interfere with the desires of the uh, minute, minute uh, so-called independent living entities who, who, who are striving to be act as if they're independent of God. But then Prabhupada says, however, one who desires Krishna, then the Lord takes special care and encourages the devotee to desire in such a way that one can attain him and be eternally happy. Hmm. <clears throat> so therefore, uh, Krishna can engage one uh, in pious activities so that he can be ele elevated and go back to Godhead. And he also can engage one in impious activities so that they can go to hell. So <laughs> it's a pretty harsh thing, but it's the fact. Everything depends on our desires. So a living entity is completely dependent in his distress and happiness. By the will of the Supreme, he can go to heaven or hell as a cloud is driven by the air. Therefore, the embodied soul, by his immemorial desire to avoid Krishna consciousness, causes his own bewilderment. Consequently, although he is constitutionally eternal, blissful, and cognizant, due to the littleness of his existence, he forgets his constitutional position of service to the Lord and is thus entrapped by ignorance or nescience. And under the spell of ignorance, the living entity claims that the Lord is responsible for his conditional existence. So, therefore, it's said that Krishna neither hates nor likes anyone, although it appears to be like that. He simply, uh, you know, God, uh, man proposes, God disposes. We, we want certain things, and if we insist on wanting the wrong thing, Krishna says, okay then you're not listening to anything I say, then now you're under the, under the, uh, the uh, discipline of Durga. And Durga means something very, very uh, inauspicious because there's just suffering. There's suffering in the body. There's suffering caused by others. There's suffering caused by nature. And, and we can't, you know, as soon as one suffering is over, another one comes. And it's never ending. So therefore, we need to wake up and understand what is our real position in the material world. Therefore, Prabhupada has uh, given so much information about uh, the real nature of the material world and what is the real constitutional position of the living entity. And then, therefore, he says, uh, therefore, Krishna says, when, however, one is enlightened with the knowledge by which ignorance is destroyed, then his knowledge reveals everything as the sun lights up everything in the daytime. So, this is uh, what you would call Janagni Dagda Karmanam, the fourth chapter. Uh, 19th verse, Krishna explains this really nicely. He says, <clears throat> We read this yesterday. Yes, yes, Sarvesh, Samaramba, Kama, 
Sankalpa Varjita, Janakni Dakta Karma, Nam Tamahu uh, Pandita Buddha. So this verse says, one is understood to be in full knowledge whose every endeavor is devoid of desire for sense gratification. He's said by sages to be a worker for whom the reactions of work have been burned up by the fire of perfect knowledge. So reactions of work means one's karma. So uh, the symptom of the devotee, again, now we're getting more information. One is the devotee never tires of hearing about Krishna's transcendental pastimes, qualities, etc. Now, number two, the devotee has lost all desire for sense gratification. So in other words, in the eyes of the materialists, a devotee is a party pooper. <laughs> yeah. And they say, okay, now, you know, it's New Year's Eve, we're gonna have a great time. Uh, my wife ordered the champagne for everybody. It's gonna flow like a river tonight. And the devotee said, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm gonna, uh, Skip this one. This is, what? Come on, we have we have the spare ribs and uh, this thing and that thing and you know we're gonna have eat and and drink and be merry and dance and and be foolish and happy. He said, "Well, uh, I'm gonna pass on this one." What? Are you crazy? No, I'm uh, I'm really sober. <laughs> So, therefore, this is this, uh, these are the symptoms of a devotee. They're, they're not pursuing sense gratification. Their desire for it is finished, is dead. Therefore, they're considered dead by their friends and relatives. You see, they consider, oh, you're, you're a dead man. You don't know how to enjoy life. The devotee says, no, I'm going to go to the temple tonight on New Year's Eve and really celebrate it by chanting Hare Krishna and dancing and feasting and just uh, uh, being completely overwhelmed by the beauty of Radha and Krishna. So, uh, therefore it says, only a person in full knowledge can understand the activities of a person in Krishna consciousness. Yeah, people who don't have knowledge, they say, well, I don't understand that person, it's the, the, they've changed it. It's the fault of that Hari Vilas and that Hari Krishna temple. They ruined this person. <laughs> you, know, you see? I think it's my fault. <laughs> no, we didn't ruin anybody. I remember when uh, Dhananjaya was initiated, his parents were here. And I tried to reassure them that you're not losing your son. You're gaining him because he's going to be a real son now. So, people don't understand that in the beginning, but later on, they they say, yeah, he, he's much more sensitive, much more kind, and I can count on him. I know that uh, he's not going to be doing anything foolish or stupid. And so, you know, uh, they feel the rapport of genuine affection coming from uh, their their devoted child much more real than uh, the other children who might be completely overwhelmed with bad habits. Because a person in Krishna consciousness is devoid of all kinds of sense gratificatory propensities, it is to be understood that he has burned up all the reactions of his work by perfect knowledge. That's what it means, janagni. Uh, Janagni, dagda, karmanam. So janagni means the fire of knowledge. Dagda means uh, <coughs> agni, uh, uh, or fire. Uh, uh, and da, uh, dagda means burned. And karmanam means uh, whose uh, karmic reactions are completely burned up by the fire of knowledge. This is like a fire. It burns impurities. And then it says, it is to be understood that he has burned up the reactions of his work by perfect knowledge of his constitutional position as the eternal servitor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Well, 
that's what we read today also, right? That the constitutional position is to be always dependent on the Lord. That, that dependency on the Lord and full faith in the goodwill of the Lord is the symptom of a devotee. Uh, yes, so then uh, it says, development of this knowledge of eternal servitorship to the Lord is compared to fire. Such a fire, once kindled, can burn up all kinds of reactions to work. So we are servants. We're either we're going to serve Maya, or we're going to serve Krishna. There's no escaping it. And if you have no one else to serve, then you buy a dog and serve the dog. We can see that. People are walking with the dog down the street. The dog stops. Its tail goes up. Its butt goes down. And it passes stool. Now, dog stool is really nasty stuff. And then the servitor of the dog takes a plastic bag out of their pocket, puts it on backwards on the hand, picks up the stool, then wrap, then puts the bag back in the right position and ties it or something, and then holds it and then continues walking with the dog. So who's the servant? <laughs> Who is the servant, the dog or the master? The master is the servant of the dog. He's picking up the stool of the dog, you see. And these are rich people. These are, these are the PhDs walking down, and they let the dog lick, their, uh, lick food off of their own plate while they're eating. And they, they sleep with the dog in the same bed so that all the, all the germs from the dog's anus goes all over the bed and all over the master. And in this way, they are servants because they don't want to serve God, G-O-D. They serve dog. Uh, God, G-O-D, they serve dog, D-O-G, right? So God backwards is dog. So you know how many dogs there are in the United States? It's an unbelievable number. They have, uh, you know what Petco is? Petco is a chain of stores only dedicated to the dog. And how about all these veterinarians? Most of the veterinarians, they take care of dogs and cats. So because they don't have God, they have dog, the opposite. <clears throat> and with the dog, they have dog poop and dog pee and dog germs and so forth. And when the dog is licking their face, they say, Oh, how much does my dog love me? But when the dog is licking their face, the dog is saying, Oh, you taste so good. One day I'm going to eat you. See? They think the dog loves them, but the dog is getting the taste of the flesh of the uh, so-called master because one day they'll eat them. So here we see that... Uh, the devotees are different, very much different, but who can understand them? Very few people can understand. So then, to finish, uh, real knowledge can only be received from a person who is fixed up in Krishna consciousness. And therefore, Prabhupada says, the living entity is bewildered in so many ways. For instance, when he unceremoniously thinks himself God, he actually falls into the last snare of ignorance. If a living entity is God, then how can he become bewildered by ignorance? Does God become bewildered by ignorance? If so, then ignorance is Satan, or Satan is greater than God. Now here's the main point. Real knowledge can be obtained from a person who is in perfect Krishna consciousness. Therefore, one has to seek out such a bona fide spiritual master and under him learn what Krishna consciousness is. For Krishna consciousness will certainly drive 
away all nations as the sun drives away darkness. Even though a person may be in full knowledge that he is not this body, but is transcendental to the body, he still may not be able to discriminate between the soul and the super soul. Hmm. However, he can know everything well if he cares to take shelter of a perfect, bona fide Krishna conscious spiritual master. One can know God and one's relationship with God only when one actually meets a representative of God. A representative of God never claims that he is God, although he is paid all the respect ordinarily paid to God because he has knowledge of God. One has to learn the distinction between God and the living entity. Lord Sri Krishna therefore stated in the second chapter, 12th verse, that every living being is individual and that the Lord also is individual. They were all individuals in the past, they are individuals at present, and they will continue to be individuals in the future, even after liberation. At night, we see everything as one in the darkness, but in the day, when the sun is up, we see everything in its real identity. Identity with individuality and spiritual life is real knowledge. Now, what does that mean? Like, you read that and you say, ah, I don't exactly understand what that means. Identity with individuality in spiritual life is real knowledge. It means that you are part and parcel of Krishna. Therefore, you have identity as a part and parcel of the Lord. The Lord is the supreme, and you are the infinitesimally small part and parcel. That's identity. You're identifying with the Lord, right? It doesn't mean you are the Lord, but you're part and parcel of the Lord. And then in, with individuality, it means that, and you are an eternal person as the Lord is an eternal person. That's what this means, identity with individuality. It took me a long time to understand that also. I, I kept reading identity with individuality. Isn't that, aren't they both synonymous? I have an identity as a person, and I have individuality as a person. But it means actually I, identifying yourself with the Lord as the part and parcel of the Lord. And, but yet you're a unique individual. Or in other words, achintya beda abeda tattva. Simultaneously one and inconceivably different. Okay, so if we look at Okay, now this is why I was getting confused. I have my notes here, and I'm following my notes. Uh, this is even further explained by Srila Prabhupada. Okay, let's take a look here. So if we look at the uh, sixth, Srimad uh, Bhagavatam, sixth canto, ninth chapter, 38th verse, it says, with deliberation, one will see that the Supreme Soul, although manifested in different ways, is actually the basic principle of everything. Now, this is a highly sophisticated, profound, philosophical point. Philosophers, or philosophers, are very concerned about primary and secondary qualities. But they do it on the relative frame of, of existence, not with reference to the absolute plane. So this simple statement here, with deliberation, one will see that the Supreme Soul, although manifested in different ways, is actually the basic principle of everything. So that means the primary quality of everything is Krishna. Like if you look at a person, you see a body, but actually, by reading Bhagavad Gita, we're learning to see Chitra Gyan Chapimam Vidi Sarvachitra Subharata. That there's two persons in that body. There's the individual jiva and there's Paramatma. But the individual jiva is part and part of, parcel of Paramatma. Therefore, Paramatma is the real prime, primal quality of everything, whether it's matter or Spirit, whether it, everywhere you, you look, we're being taught by reading Bhagavad Gita, everywhere you look, you should see Krishna. 
Does that mean that everything is Krishna? No, because there's identity with individuality. Everything is one and different from the Lord. But the Lord is the primary quality of everything. Now you look up, your homework is, you look up on uh, the internet, uh, primary and secondary qualities, and you look at the way they explain that. It's a bunch of nonsense. And they teach that in, in, in philosophy classes. And it's complicated, and it's nonsense, and it's all relative. See? Because they reject the existence of anything absolute. Whereas I just explained, well, not me, but Prabhupada just explained in a simple, well, actually it's uh, Sukadev Goswami, in a simple sentence, he just explained something that's been misunderstood since the times of, time of the Greeks. What is primary and secondary qualities? So, he's, so this verse says, with deliberation, one will see that the supreme soul, although manifested in different ways, is actually the basic principle of everything. The total material energy is the cause of the material manifestation, but the material energy is caused by him, meaning Krishna. Therefore, he is the cause of all causes. That's what it means by the primal, primal quality of everything. He is the cause of all causes. The manifester of intelligence and the senses. He is, the, he is perceived as the super soul of everything. Without him, everything would be dead. You, as that, as that super soul, the supreme controller, are the only one remaining. So Krishna, in the beginning, is one. Then he expands into many. And in the end, he's one again. Right? And everything is contained within him. So Krishna is the prime quality of everything. So it's a very interesting verse. And... That's why it says, I worship the personality of Godhead Govinda who enters the existence of every universe and every atom by one of his plenary portions and thus manifests his infinite energy throughout the material creation. So Prabhupada says, by his one plenary portion as Paramatma, Antaryami, the Lord is all-pervading throughout the unlimited universes. He is the Pratyag, or Antaram, Antaryami, of all living entities. Antaryami means indwelling uh, quality or person of everything. The Lord says in Bhagavad Gita 13.3, Chitra Gyam Shapimam Vidhi Sarvad Chitra Bharata. O Skyan of Bharata, you should understand that I am also the knower in all bodies because the Lord is the super soul. He is the active principle of every living entity and even the atom. Andantarasta Paramanu Chayantarasta. He is the actual reality. According to various stages of intelligence, one realizes the presence of the Supreme in everything through the manifestations of his energy. The entire world is permeated by the three gunas and one can understand his presence according to one's modes of material nature. So the mode of material nature of the living entity is nil. But the, the, the devotee is in, in transcendental to the modes, but he still has a mode. He's in the... He's in the Visuddha Sattva mode, or Suddha Sattva mode, transcendental goodness, but not just goodness or passion or ignorance. All right, we'll stop right there, and, and I'm going to finish this particular thing tomorrow. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, what will the cost of a carton of, of Bhagavad Gita's be for the G Gita Jyanti? So he wants to buy a box of Gita's. Yes. Do you happen to know the cost? It's $100.
or hundred, I think, hundred and eight dollars. You get sixteen uh, hardbound books, or you could get, a, uh, yeah, sixteen hardbound books, and and that is a real deal. It almost costs a hundred dollars for us to to buy them. One hundred and eight dollars. Okay, that of course was not related to our lecture today, but uh, <laughs> it has something to do with what's going to happen next Friday, which is Gita Jayanti. Okay, thank you. Yes. So, so Maharaj, uh, just, uh, speak, speak in the microphone. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. So going back to the example of uh, the guard versus, you know, the people who don't believe or uh, relate to the guard, they have a friendship with the dog. The dog, it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but the general uh, reasoning that they give is that the dog is faithful. And that's why, you know, whereas they cannot trust even the people around them, that they somehow uh, you know, think that uh, the dog is actually demonstrating more loyalty to them and that, that they're willing to work <laughs> for the dog. But they are not willing to be loyal to God. Yeah. So what good is the loyalty of the go of the dog? If I'm loyal to Hitler, does that make me good? If I'm loyal to the dog, does that make me good? The dog is loyal to you. If if it, if Hitler was your best friend, does that and, and would do anything for you? Does that does that mean you're good? Hmm. So well, we can learn from the dog. Yeah, that, that's, we should be loyal to God. Hmm. Right. But no, he's saying, oh, he's loyal to me. That means I am God for the dog. There's an interesting book written like about this. It was written by uh, one of the most famous uh, modern German uh, authors. Uh, <laughs> I might forget his name right now. Anyway, it's a story about a man who has a dog. And he lives alone in a little apartment, uh, maybe on the fourth or fifth floor of the building. There's no elevator, he has to walk up and down. And his whole life centers around the dog. And, you know, because the dog is cooped up in that, in that little room with him, in that little apartment, the dog's always excited to go out for a walk, right? So then the master of the dog, re realizing how anxious the dog is to get out of the room to go walk, he developed this crazy idea in his mind that the dog's trying to run away from him. But see, he was enjoying the fact that the dog was dependent on him for everything, right? Because the dog's stuck in that room with him. So he purposely broke the leg of the dog so that he could take care of it and the dog would be even more dependent on him and would, wouldn't be so excited to run out of the house. So it's, it's a psychological type of book, right? So <laughs> you say it doesn't mean anything that the dog is dependent uh, or, or loyal, right? Uh, because he's taking himself to be God. He breaks the leg of the dog, mm. right? But uh, he should learn from the dog that that's the way he should be to God. So he's misreading the whole, uh, let's say, relationship. Mm. And that, see, that's what happens when you have half knowledge, then everything you do is gonna, only going to be half right. That means the other half is wrong. So he didn't understand what the loyalty of the dog is, uh, points to, that he should be the dog of God. Okay? Yep. Okay, thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. There's a uh, song by Bhakti.